Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today for our Road to Research series. Um, today, I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Gustavo Moraletz, who's an associate professor um, here at Rowan University in the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry. His background is in synthetic and organic chemistry with an emphasis on drug design, and he has been with uh, Rowan now for eight years. So without further ado, um, I want to introduce Dr. Moraletz, but I do have one quick thing I'd like to, to, run, uh, to review with you. Everyone's microphones have been muted to cut down on background noise, and we will have an opportunity for a question and answer session after um, Dr. Moraletz's presentation. So please post all your questions to the chat session, and we'll get them. We'll get to them at the end. So again, here's Dr. Gustavo Moraletz. Thank you so much. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, I would like to thank um, Jennifer Ravelli for the opportunity to to talk to you. And um, I want to commend the College of Science and Math Dean's Office for this series of, of webinars. I think, especially in these times, it's very important that we keep communicating with each other and, and discussing about science and what, what do we do and how do we get to do it? So um, this opportunity, I want to talk about some of the research that I do but I want to spend some time talking about how did I get here, and you know the struggles, the successes, um, like the adventure of becoming a scientist. So, uh, but bear with me. Okay, so I would like to say I'm a hypothesis-driven scientist, and to get here, or to get to that spot. Um, I've, uh, you have to think about new ideas. You have to think about how to create science. Um, I will say before you ever get to this point, before you ever feel like you can create science, you, wa you have to be able to do it. You have to learn to do it. You have to acquire the skills that get you to be able to you know, do the science that you are thinking about. And the real question is, how much do you need to read and prepare to get to create science? And the answer is a lot. You spend years, if not decades, preparing to get to the point where you can create science, to, to, to get to the point where you can think about science. And I would say, is it worthwhile getting a PhD and pursuing academia? I would say it's 100% uh, worthwhile. I love what I do. Uh, I had a blast in my PhD and, and uh, you know, being a professor and doing science and mentoring students and getting to teach science is extremely rewarding in my opinion. So I, I highly recommend it. But as we discuss these issues, I want to give you a quick rundown of how did I get to be uh, an organic chemist and, and I guess, how did I arrive to, to being able to, to become a scientist? I'm native to Peru. I grew up uh, in Peru in a, in, a, in a country where science is not um, understood correctly. Uh, they, in, in, in the country I grew up, uh, science is more, um, I mean, it's non-existent. They think of technology as science. They think of products as science. No, they don't think of, of basic science as an overwhelming need to get to the point where you can create new ideas. So there wasn't, I mean, I went to a, to a very good university uh, to get my undergrad, but the concept of research was non-existent. Um, so, so I have no idea about science, I actually, I didn't want to go to, to, um, to college. I, I really wanted to play soccer when I was a kid. I was, I was decent at it, but I got injured when I was finishing high school. So my mom um, told me that I had to go to college. So I went, I was, you know, I was in between biology and chemistry and eventually I, I, I stick to chemistry. Um, I mean, I, I was good in chemistry. I was good. I thought I was a good student, but it wasn't like I was like, oh my God, this is 
you know, this is going to be my life. Uh, I have no idea about grad school or what grad school meant. Um, the only thing I knew as I was about to graduate from undergrad was that I did not want to get an office job. I did not want to get an industry job. I was so afraid of the possibility of an eight to five job. So I decided that I want to pursue a, a graduate program in the United States. And I, I barely spoke English. I, I mean, I barely speak English still now. So it was a complete gamble for me. I, I decided to move uh, you know, uh, uh, to a different country, and you know, in the hopes that I would enjoy doing doing science. So I I, I pursue a master program at UMass in uh, in, in Massachusetts, and it was it was it was quite challenging for me because not only there was an English, the English the language barrier, but uh, I didn't know what I was doing. I was not properly trained or properly mentored, but I just persevered. I just kept pushing. I knew I didn't want to go back. Uh, so eventually I finished my master's and I went to pursue a PhD at the University of Pittsburgh. And although, and although I will, I will um, say that I, I had a great time in my PhD, I never felt throughout my PhD that I could think about science. I was great at it. I did very good science. I learned to do it. I, I never felt like I was able to think about it, to create science. Even after I was done with my PhD, I never felt like I could do it. Uh, I never felt like I could become a professor. So I, after I finished my PhD in University of Pittsburgh, I went to Ohio State University to do a fellowship. And even there, Although it was a very successful experience, professionally speaking, I never felt like a scientist. I never felt like I could, oh, I had an idea and I could do this, right? It, that, it took a long time for me to feel that way. And it wasn't until I, until I was a fellow at Memorial Sloan Kettering in New York City. And a couple of years into the fellowship where I began to think about uh, science in a different way. And, I think the bottom line here is that it's a, it is a long process and it's an, it's a, it requires a, a degree of em emotional maturity to get to the point where you can think about science in a creative way. And eventually I decided that I wanted to become a professor. It wasn't something that I was, I was cognizant. Like it, it wasn't like, oh, I want to become a professor. 10 years later, I became a professor. Uh, it was something like, it just happened. Like I was invited to teach a class because the, the, the professor teaching this class at, at, um, at Memory Snow Catering wasn't available. So I kind of like joined the last minute and I really liked teaching. And that was my first time, you know, doing something even close to teaching. So my story uh, is full of like gambling and, and think, jumping on opportunities without really thinking too much about it. And, you know, it worked out for me, but I, I have a lot of um, um, colleagues and friends throughout my, my time in science that um, they were in science, but they, not, they did not continue in science because science wasn't for them or, or academia wasn't for them or, or chemistry wasn't for them. And, and that's just fine. I think the message that I would like to deliver to all of you young scientists is that you have to try. You have to gamble, and you cannot just let the status quo um, get you and surrender for something that for something less than you were, than what you dream to have. Um, you need to just push and work hard and persevere, and you know things will not be easy, but you know success is always at the end of the road. So, after that pep talk, I want to show you how is that I think about science. Um, so I like to think about chemistry as chemical space. This is what I, I see every day. This is the way I think. This is the way my brain thinks about molecules. Um, these are all possible molecules that we could make when, you, when we think about molecules containing carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, some of the, the more organic uh, atoms. So there is like, a lot of potential molecules. 
So as much as I would like to make them all, the question is how do we go about choosing which aspects of this, which regions of this chemical space do we want to focus on? Which molecules are more important than others? And we want to focus on the biologically relevant regions of chemical space, the overlapping region between what is important in chemistry and what is important in biology. And more importantly, I would like to focus on molecules, on architectures, and on, on the scaffolds that look like the molecules that we obtain from nature. I think it is very likely that molecules that look like natural products will share some of the properties that these natural products have. So based on that concept, I like to focus on nitrogen containing heterocycles as potential molecules that have intrinsically relevant pharmacological properties. And especially on molecules that look like this. This is called a diacyridine, this little triangle with two nitrogen, and this oxacyridine. And I believe that despite this, the fact that these have a lot of potential as therapeutics, these can also be used as templates to build larger heterocycles, more complex heterocycles unknown heterocycles. So we can begin to populate these regions of chemical space that are quote unquote untouched that also overlap with biological space with the regions of biological space that are relevant to organic chemistry and begin to discover not only new molecules, not only new reactions, but molecules that have potential to impact our society as therapeutics. So I'm not alone in this field. There is like thousands of organic chemists thinking in similar ways. And I just want to give you an example of some of the more well-known um, drugs out there and they all contain nitrogen, they all are heterocycles, and they're all made and designed and, um, and taught through by organic chemists like myself. Um, this slide should just give you a sense of how powerful, how relevant these, these science can be. It defines our ability to, to treat diseases because we need to have these small molecules to target the biological processes that define these, these complex um, um, diseases. So this is my slide on how to go about discovering a new chemical reaction. I like to define myself as a, as a chemical reaction inventor. Um, that sounds, I, I wanna say that sounds kind of catchy, but it is not easy whatsoever. So I will say the first thing that, that I would recommend for anybody that wants to venture into creating science, you need to read a lot. Old books, new books, papers, reviews, lots of readings. And despite all that, despite this, 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 uh, this sort of fake paradigm uh, where we, we think we can think about something and we wanna go into the lab and prove it, most of science is, is luck. I would say 80%, if not 90% of science is luck. It's just scientists bumping into a result that they were not expecting. Now, the other 20% is how do you go about, um, what do you do with this event, with this luck that you have had? And in, when it comes down to inventing new chemical reactions, it's all about understanding the reaction mechanism. It's all about doing experiments that allow us to probe the reaction mechanism so we can understand how these new products are being formed. So the devil lays on the details, right? Always focusing on details. Um, 
So I'm gonna, the next few slides are gonna be relatively specific to what I do. So I'm gonna go uh, through them relatively fast. Feel free to, uh, in, the, in the question section, to question, to ask me if you have any, uh, any specific questions regarding some of the chemistry that we're doing. So again, to be able to discover anything, you need to learn what has been done in the past. You need to learn everything, or you at least usually intend to learn everything known about the particular project that you are working on. So not only you avoid repeating science, but you, you are able to learn what to do and what not to do in terms of what the science that you want to do. So we'll go to this slide relatively quickly. Many people have worked on this chemistry uh in the past and, and relatively recently and people have used these diacyridines to make more complex heterocycles in, in in complex ways so there is a lot of data out there a lot of efforts out there to make these molecules in you know some some very successful ways some less successful ways so with all this background, I, um, some of this chemistry was published recently in transforming oxaciridines into more complex heterocycles. So with all of this background, I, we come up with this idea. We can take these aldehydes and react them with amines to make, uh, and this oxidizing agent to make these complex diacyridines. The way this reaction is formulated is was completely new when we work on this, and you know we were able to to prove it to work for a large number of substrates, and we focus a lot on understanding the mechanism why this this was working the way it was, um, and that gave us a very a very good insight not only into this particular reaction but. Other particular re other reactions that, that were formed uh, were forming uh, side products and that eventually allow us to discover other projects to deco discover other pathways into newer reactions. Um, for example, in this particular case, we discovered that although we can make diacyridines under as uh, basic conditions, under slightly acidic conditions, we can make oxides and nitriles. We also were interested in addressing the formation of this particular set of diacyridines using ammonia. Um, we were able to tune the reaction conditions based on the substrate to selectively make the diacyridine over this triacine um, so we then were also interested in transforming these diacyridines into more complex heterocycles, as you can see here. And without going into too many details, we were able to selectively um, change the reactivity of the heterocycle based on the electronic nature of the groups around the nitrogen. So when we have an electron donating group, the chemistry behaves one way, when we have an electron withdrawing group, the chemistry behaves in a different way. And again, always focusing on the mechanism. Here we have an, a diradical pathway, and here we have an ionic pathway. This works very well for alkenes, but also works very well for alkynes using a similar pathway. We were also interested in transforming these diacyridines, in oxidizing them in, in, into diacyridines. And we were able to use this to achieve this using BTMA um, iodate. And again, we can look at the mechanism and rationalize why is this happening the way it's happening. Um, without going into too many details, as we fully understood this reaction, we discovered uh, a subset of other pathways that have led us to discover other reactions. So, so as you can see, although sometimes can be very laborious, very uh, tiring, the process of, of understanding each step and each step on a given mechanism is only through this 
thought process, to this effort that we get to discover new things. And, and science is not about uh, discovering, you know, big paradigm shifting events. Science, at least most of science, is, is about the small, tiny increments of science that we can do. The small, tiny discoveries that over time accumulate towards making a big discovery. So every bit of science, every bit of effort helps towards this, this overarching hypothesis of always moving forward in creating new science. Then we discover that we can oxidize these unprotect, we call it unprotected diacyridines and the, using visible light into this type of diacyridines. And we have some examples and we have a mechanism where we can use visible light and these photocatalysts that allow us to oxidize these diacyridines, these diacyridines into diacyridines. And that, that, that's pretty cool. I, it's, it's a, it's a, a new reaction. Nobody has done it in the way we're doing it. We later found that we can transform these diacyridines and do take them into more complex heterocycles by doing uh, similar uh, reaction. Um, these are called cycloaddition reactions, where we take a, a, a strong Lewis acid that achieves a, 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 a rearrangement across this diacyridine to make this other reactive intermediate that then reacts in, with alkenes or alkynes. So we have a few examples like that. We also speculate that these diacyridines could potentially become carbenes that then react with different pi systems, either alkenes or aldehydes or imines, to make more complex heterocycles. And we, we have discovered we can achieve this relatively well. So that's great. We also venture into trying different chemistry with, with hydrazines. And this, I put this slide because it's a very good example of how understanding the mechanism allows you to understand why different products are formed. And let me show you. The mechanism allows us to understand that, for example, depending, up, uh, depending upon the nature of the keto ester, we can achieve these tetrasoceturic pyrosols or these pyrazolones, all these ethoxy pyrazoles, and all of this is logically explained based on the mechanisms and how the equilibrium of the reaction it tilts on one way or the other based on the nature of the substrate. So, so again, this is a very good example of how thorough analysis of the reaction mechanisms allows us to understand the chemistry that we're observing. It's not just about doing reaction. It's about thinking about the reaction and what is exactly happening when you're doing the reaction. We also try to react hydrazines with um, ureas to make triazoles, and that works very well as well. Um, then we venture into understanding the chemistry behind oxaciridines. These are also well known. And we want to, to one, one of the bigger, bigger premises behind the chemistry that we do in my lab is to try to do chemistry that is environmentally friendly. I know that might sound like an oxymoron given the fact that we generate so much organic waste in my lab, but at the best of our abilities, we always aim to develop reaction conditions that avoid first using complex purification systems. Second, using um, you know, environmentally um, um, dangerous organic solvents or, or, or reagents. So under those two premises, we always are looking for ways to improve chemical reactions, to make them easier to do, to make them more environmentally friendly, to make them, to make them greener. So this is one of those examples where we are able to make these complex molecules from these simple substrates using very simple reaction conditions. So again, 
this is the mechanism, and I, I want to I, I wanna put emphasis in the fact that we always think about the mechanism. To be able to create science, you need to think about how exactly your science is happening. So we discover that we can actually react these simple molecules, commercially available molecules, to make this nitron that then under visible light makes oxacetylenes. This is a new reaction. It has not been developed by anybody else. So we are able to do this very efficiently for a, a variety of substrates. Um, and this is the mechanism. Again, we're still working on exactly how things are happening here, but this is our basic understanding of how the, the photocatalytic reaction is happening. So you can see how this is, this is very green, right? We're using as a source of energy, um, visible light, just, just a light bulb. In, in principle, you can put this reaction flask in the window cell and let the sun do, do the work and the reaction work equally well. So this is a type of reactions that are very hot right now. They're very, very um, important because you are achieving high efficient transformations without having to use complex or, or wasteful uh, chemicals. Again, we also discovered that depending on the nature of the nitron, we can achieve uh, another step beyond the oxygen that takes us to this amine. And this is also um, unknown. So there's a new reaction for us. Again, we have a, an ongoing mechanism. Um, we are not fully, uh, we're still working on, on, on fully understanding the mechanism. But again, this is, this is the only path that we uh, are, um, that we do, right? We have to understand the mechanism. We have to go through this path to be able to, to validate the chemistry that we are pursuing. Um, so this is something that we're working on right now. And I mean, we were working before the pandemic, we need to retake it. So can we take diacetylenes into diacetylenes, these four membranes, these are very unknown. Nobody really knows what they do in, on a cell or, or, or uh, in terms of like pharmacological properties because nobody has made these molecules before. So we have some good results and, and, a, and a relatively good understanding of the mechanism. So we can make these four membrane heterocycles that are, you know, that are pretty cool. Uh, we can also do it with oxacetylenes to make oxacetylenes in a similar looking mechanism. In summary, my goal as a scientist, as a reaction inventor is to invent chemical reactions that allow us to make new heterocycles, molecules that have not been made before, molecules that most likely will have very powerful pharmacological profiles that will allow us to discover new ways to target socially relevant diseases. So this is, this is a, a summary of some of the molecules that we can make in the lab through new chemical reactions. So we are working, we have a, a variety of new projects, all, all of them stemming from what we have discovered in the lab. So in that way, we are very proud of the chemistry that we do since it is all created our own one. We're not borrowing science from anybody else. We're not bringing in ideas from anybody else. We, everything is being created our own one and we are expanding. We collaborate with other, other scientists at Rowan to create more science. So that is just great. Uh, this is an old um, picture of my group, but none of these, none of these, what I have presented to you will be possible without the students, without the undergraduate students. Uh, I've been blessed to be at Rowan uh, and to have met so many wonderful uh, young potential scientists with so much energy, so much drive, that have catapulted my, my academic career into becoming relatively successful. I have got, gotten several awards. And as much as, I, as much as the award has my name on it, it is their effort. It is their, their dedication, their struggle that have led me to, to be at the spot that I am right now. Um, 
so so I'm um very thankful and in uh, I owe, owe everything to them because I wouldn't I wouldn't be at the place that I am if it wasn't because of them. Uh, I have um I mean I know some of my students are in the audience, so thank you. <laughs> but I'm I'm very committed to 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 funneling students into pursuing uh, scientific careers. I have uh, placed many students, many undergrads into PhD programs across the nation. And I'm very proud to say that uh, my very first research student, so a student that graduated from Roma with a, with, a, with a biochem degree, just finished her PhD at the University of Pittsburgh. And she will be going to following, um, pursuing a, a postdoctoral fellowship at Boston University. So I think I'm very proud for, for her accomplishments. And it just goes to show you that it's all about hard work. It's all about persever perseverance and, and pushing and working hard for what you want. So uh, I look forward to, to you know, inviting her to, to talk to some of you guys if, if she's in, in town. But yeah, that, that's, her name is Adriana Gambino and she just, I think she's, she's defending her PhD thesis this week or something like that. Anyways, um, thank you very much for listening to me. Uh, I hope this was um, helpful. Uh, I found, I hope you found the chemistry, the science interesting. And if any of you that are looking to do research that are interested in joining a research group, um, I'm always welcome I always welcome new students. I always, I'm always interested in recruiting energetic, driven students that want to do science. I don't really care about your experience with chemistry in the past. I just want your energy, your commitment, your um, willingness to work hard. So if you are interested in research, do not hesitate to email me. I'll be happy to welcome you in the lab. Anyways, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Morlets. This is that was a great talk. Um, and while we have while we're on the the discussion of research and people having access to research at Rowan, we're going to share in the chat box some information about our summer undergraduate research program. And I'm also going to share um, our next Road to Research um, series. So those are great ways to get involved in research. We do have a couple of questions in the in the chat box that I'd love to ask you, and I would also welcome everyone out in our audience to send some questions in. So our first question is, what are some of the challenges that you've faced as a research venturing into new research platform forms that you were not familiar with? Um, so as a professor, um, it's, it's, very, it's very difficult. It's very difficult to, uh, to learn new things. Uh, it's exciting to learn new things, but in science, there, there is an old premise that, that sort of like uh, states that you want to focus on what you're known to be good at. So changing fields or learning new skills is great, but earning the, the, um, the community respect when you, want, when you go into a new field is very challenging. So um, that's something that I, I'm not, um, I, how to say, um, I haven't been very, been very successful at. I try sometimes to do, you know, to venture into, into tangents away from organic chemistry. And sometimes things work, sometimes don't, things don't work. And I'm lucky that I'm in a, in, a, in, a, in a place in my career where I can take these, these, these chances, where I can gamble with, with projects, with science that I am not very comfortable with. Um, and I think that, that that is the beauty of academia, that you can, you can change um, paths, you can find new things, and sometimes things work, sometimes don't, things don't work. I, I particularly feel that the translational science, when you change fields, is, is very challenging and is non, non is, I would say, most of, one of the most difficult things to do as a scientist. Right. Um Another question that we have is, did you have any mentors that helped you along the way? And how did you, how did you find those mentors, if so? So uh, that's, a that's a really good question. I meant to talk about that. So when I was an undergrad, 
I always think I'm very, um, let's say, I don't want to use the word aggressive, but like outgoing, right? Like I never hesitated to ask for something when I wanted it. So that I, it, it was in my mind as an undergrad that it would be very challenging to get to a, a very prestigious university in the US because, you know, nobody really knows Peru, right? Nobody really knows, you know, the university that I was in Peru. So like, how would I prove my, um, my proficiency on paper? So I was lucky enough that there was a Peruvian professor uh, visiting my university and I asked, I asked uh, somebody that knew him to, to, to show me who he was so I could actually go and talk to him. So I, I, he was talk, talking in the, in the, in the hall, uh, he was walking on the hallway and I just like went to him. I mean, like, listen, I wanna work for you whatever it is that you are in the US. So he was like, he, he, he fully embraced my, my um, let's say energy. And he was my mentor, my, my advisor at UMass. Um, he wasn't great though. Uh, <laughs> he was very hands-off and I, what I needed was hands-on mentorship. So I, I learned a lot of things on my own or we like the, my peers in the lab, but he was very good at uh, selling science and painting a picture of, of what science can be for me. So, so that really worked for me. Um, he, you know, he, he encouraged me to, to pursue a PhD and to pursue academia and whatnot. So I'm, I'm very grateful in that regard. Uh, in my PhD, I chose, so when I went to the University of Pittsburgh, uh, Pittsburgh was, let's say, uh, top, top six, top seven uh, organic chemistry uh, department in the country, if not the world. So I decided to, to work for like one of the best organic chemists out there. Sometimes when you when you pick a great scientist as an advisor, uh, they don't have a lot of time to work with you. So my my PhD advisor wasn't super hands-on as well. But I feel like I, I learned other aspects of how to be a scientist from him. Um, so I, I would say in terms of mentorship, I been sometimes lucky, sometimes unlucky that I have never, uh, I never had like a, a, a mentor that fully embraced me and like sort of like has been along my side all the time. I've been able to, to pick uh, or to learn from, from whoever was working with me or whoever was uh, my advisor at different stages of my life, of my career. And, you know, they go whatever they needed from me and I go whatever I needed from them. So when I, when I, as an advisor I go, I try to, to provide some of the, the, the feedback, some of the mentorship that I wasn't given as a student. Um, so I try to fill in those gaps as my particular experience, I did not have them. Great. So I have a, another question of what did you consider when you were deciding your next steps of your career, choosing a PhD program, doing a postdoc fellowship, seeking uh, a tenure track position? Mm -hmm. Was there anything about the process at each step that surprised you at the time? So uh, when, when, I was, uh, when I was looking for, back when I was in my country, there was no internet, right? So it wasn't like I could just wow. Google. Uh, I mean, like internet came late to my country, I guess, like this, like the, the, the year 2000. So like, I didn't have email. Uh, so like, it wasn't like I, I could just like Google schools, like what, you know, for me, Montana was the same as, um, I don't know, New York City. Like I have no, no gauge on what's better or what's worse in, in the US. I would have gone anywhere given the opportunity. Uh, obviously once I was here, I, I, I learned to use the internet <laughs> and, and learned to search for information. But um, I will say I, 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 my, my approach through my academic um, career has been like, I just jump to whatever opportunity comes first. And it, sometimes I made the wrong decision. Sometimes I make, the good, I make good decisions. 
Uh, but I, I think overall, whenever I was at, at any given point, I always realized that it was 100% up to me to make it work. Like it was, it had to be my hard work and my commitment and my willingness to work, to, to persevere, that would get things to work the way I wanted with whoever I was working with at whatever place I was. Um, when it comes down to, to pursuing a, an academic job, a professorship, I knew I wanted to work with undergrads. So I only, I only looked for universities that um, offer uh, or were focused on undergraduate research. Uh, and I was lucky enough to, to land at Rowan. And I feel like Rowan has been, has transformed so much in the last 10 years. And, I, and it was a great place for me when I joined Rowan back in 2013. And I feel like I have grown and evolved and improved uh, scientifically uh, uh, as much as, or hopefully, you know, alongside the university. So I'm very excited and I'm very happy to be, to have landed here. I feel like in retrospect, if I would have picked some of the other places that I had offers from, I would not have become as successful as I am now. So thank you, Rowan. That's great. So I have a question from um, I, uh, from a, a faculty member or may, or student that wants to know if you had if you could share some of your um, experiences through promotion and even obtaining different positions throughout your life as a professor of color. Did you ever? Um, so that, that's a very interesting question. Um, um, so. Without a doubt, uh, science and especially organic chemistry is a, is a white male dominated field. Mm -hmm. So there's no doubt about that. Um, I, I never felt um, like I was, um, you know, discriminated upon, like I never felt like I was, um, uh, you know, not giving opportunities based on, 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 on the fact that I, I was different. Um, so I, I never really struggled that way. At least if uh, I, I, it was never obvious to me that there was a clear difference. Um, but there were some instances in my career where I felt it. I definitely felt it. And, um, you, know, you, you know, you have to overcome it, right? Nobody's gonna, uh, at least in my experience, in my view, you have to keep working hard, even harder than others. So you can earn the same level of respect or the same level of, of success. Um, it, is, it is interesting because for most, for most of my career, I was not considered, um, so I, I was an alien, right? I, I wasn't, I'm not, a, I, I became American a few years ago, but for most of my career, I was an alien from a different country in, this, in, this, in, in the US. So, I did not qualify for more for a lot of the, the funding mechanisms for students, for postdocs, for uh, because despite the fact that I was I was a minority student, I was not American. So, so that was very palpable uh, throughout my career. That despite that all these opportunities were there for minority students, I wasn't giving. Uh, they were not available for me. Eventually. Um, I became American, and, and you know, you, you once your status changes, you become a, you know, you become a, um, you qualify for these opportunities. But I wasn't a student anymore. So, anyways, um, I think that, that that's a very interesting question. I wh whatever uh, struggles in that regard only made me want want it more. Only made me feel like I want to become better and more successful just to put off them wrong. Great. So we have a science question now, so bear with me because sure. I'm not a scientist. Um, in the photo redox oxidation to, dia to the diazerines, the carbon was fully substituted in the examples you show to give the N comma N double bound. What do you get if there is a proton in the carbon of the starting material? Uh, so you you, uh, you 
you can make sure that, that you 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 read it very well, uh, um, Jennifer. You. Uh, you're gonna make sure, right? So you have to design the substrate. So you either get uh, oxidation across the nitrogen nitrogen bond or oxidation across the nitrogen carbon bond. Great. All right. So I I think we're coming to the end of our questions. So if anyone has questions, please post them. But in general, what would you say are the pros and cons of being an academic and professor as a career? Uh, I love it. I think, uh, I feel like if, if I was destined to become something, I was destined to become a professor. But I completely gambled. Like, I didn't know it was going to be this way. I didn't know what I was getting into. Um, so, so definitely there's a lot of, of pros, uh, in my opinion. I feel like... Um, I don't, I don't really think there's any negative to say. Um, I have, I, you know, to be completely honest, there, uh, I, if, there is a, if there's a definition to, uh, of a happy job, I would say being a professor is, 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 very, is very close to that. One of, one of the, my classic pep talks to my students is, is, what's the point of working so hard through school, to undergrad, to eventually get a job that you're not gonna love. You want to, and if you're able, if you have the opportunity to pursue a career and eventually get a job where you, 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 know, you wake up every morning and you crave to go to work, like you're really excited about your, your, your work day, why not pursue it? And I think, and I think this applies to everybody and, and, and all phases of, of everybody's lives. If you want something, you ought to pursue it, right? And I think the reality is that not everybody has the same degrees of opportunities. And I think the value of this type of webinars, of this type of, of, of presentation is to, to, to showcase to the students that the opportunities are there, that at least we're working to provide the opportunities. So you can have similar experiences, you can have similar pathways towards achieving those sort of jobs, those sort of positions where you are, you know, very happy doing what you when you like to do. That's great. Well, thank you so much for your time and for sharing your story. If we have any other questions, please send them on over to the chat box. Um, I'm going to share with you one more time the link to the summer undergraduate research program. Um, because we have opportunities that the application is going to be opening soon. And I know that Dr. Moraletz has some positions in his lab and we can, I also want to welcome everybody to, to add to your calendar March 19th for our next Road to Research. And thank you so much, Dr. Moraletz. Um, My pleasure. Yeah, I don't seem to have any more questions. So I think that we are we're good. So I appreciate your time and I wish everyone a um, happy Friday. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Bye. Take care.